Okay, folks, here, come in, gather around. Listen here, I want to tell you a story. Uh, it's, a, it's a story that you might not know about. It's a story about when basketball here in Ireland was huge, really, really big. It's cold and wet and no black people around. I just thought, okay. They used to say to me, oh, you speak fast. I said, man, you speak faster than me. You speak like Puerto Ricans. I can see the intensity in these fans' eyes of, you have to beat this team. In the late 1970s, long, long before you guys were born, Ireland was a much different place than it is today. In the Basketball League, that was doing okay, but just barely okay. But then something amazing happened. A basketball player from Kerry called Paddy O'Connor, he decided he wanted to play basketball in a better league against better players, so he took it upon himself to change everything. Paddy O'Connor, one of the real characters of uh, Irish basketball. I grew up in the uh, neighborhood in Killarney called uh, O'Sullivan's Place, which is very sports-oriented. Basketball became a thing to do for young kids in the middle of the winter there, and uh, the fact that I was living 200 yards away from the parish hall was probably a gift. I'll always remember uh, the first opportunity I got to play for the country. Then I, you know, I played for at least 12 years on the national team. So what that did for me was it gave me the incentive to see that we weren't of a high enough standard locally or nationally to be able to compete against the better countries like Russia, Yugoslavia, and these other nations. It took someone like Paddy, who was familiar with the American scene, to say, wait a second, they're beginning to bring Americans into the UK and the rest of Europe, they're beginning to get sponsors. What about we do this? The game needed to progress and move forward, and the only way to do it was by bringing in these better quality American players who could speak English, which is a big factor. Back in the States, if you weren't part of the elite group of players picked to play in the NBA, then you had all but missed the opportunity to ever play professional basketball at home. So many of the brilliant young players who ended up narrowly missing the cut, their only opportunity to earn a living doing what they did best was to travel abroad and play European ball. In the winter of 1979, Party convinced two young ball players named Cornell Benford and Greg Hewley to come over and play for Killarney. They made their presence felt from the start, bringing a new flair to the team, and Party knew straight away that he was onto something. They adjusted very quickly into the community, but they found it very difficult. Not having fellow black people in the community was a big issue at that time. It took a lot of um, resilience, I guess, on their part to be able to handle that. It wasn't like Paddy sat down with all the clubs and all the authorities to say, right, what if we brought in these Americans? Wouldn't it be great for the profile and standard of the sport? He parachuted them in because he wanted to get the edge. Now, he wasn't in breach of a national competition rule, but he was in breach of a rule in the Constitution. The league basically had been running for a number of months. People were coming to watch the Americans play. Uh, it was felt it wouldn't be fair to take the points off Killarney, but they had to be uh, chastened somewhat, and a very heavy fine was placed on them. But they were allowed to keep the Americans. Paddy was a character. He was a charmer and he was a chancer. He was bold, brash, brilliant. He was a rogue, a maverick. I mean, even bringing in the Americans, it was more a stroke than a vision. After witnessing the impact the first two Americans had on his Killarney team, Party went back to the States looking for bigger and better players. And he arrived home with the best two Americans Killarney would ever have, Arnold Veasley from Alabama and the six foot eight inch powerhouse Tony Andre, who became the Irish League's first ever superstar. My dream all the time was to play basketball in Europe. I got a call from Coach Murphy, and he said, well, what about Ireland? I said, hmm, OK, that sounds like it'd be interesting. Got off the plane, met Party for the first time. We got to the town, and there weren't any black people. I'm like, oh, OK. 
you, you, you're, not in, you're not in Kansas anymore, <laughs> you know. I'm just in this different place. Tony was special because we're talking about a young man who came into a community again like Killarney and was immediately uh, favorable aid to the community despite how difficult it might have been for him as being one of the few black people in the community. And uh, the way he handled himself with the local people was very impressive. Outside of his talent and ability to play basketball, he was a tremendous player. This little girl walks up and rubs her finger across my skin and then looks at her finger and said, you know, it doesn't come off. You know, I didn't take offense. I just said, no, you know, this is, this is my color. And then I rubbed my hand and she, I said, see? I think by just talking to her and telling her, that opened her eyes up. It was what I dreamed about doing. You know, playing in front of some crowds, getting paid, and I didn't know I was gonna be as successful as I was. First year, of course, was the magical year. You know, we won everything. We just go to Clarnock to uh, see Tony Andre and, and the boys play it up down there, and they were dunking the basketball, right? You no, know, there wasn't a person in the country who could dunk a basketball. These boys were doing it for fun, and plus they were the size of heavy red boxes as well, you know? And we came back and we were like, how are we gonna get to that level? So the pressure was put on every club in the country, not just, not just Neptune, you know, to get Americans, otherwise Killarney were gonna run away with everything, you know? And that wasn't gonna happen. So when the race began to recruit Americans, the core clubs especially went all out to find the very best players they could to guarantee supremacy. And Neptune found an absolute gem. Terry Strickland, a 24-year-old from Mount Airy in North Carolina, landed in court. Terry was not only one of the best players to ever play, but he was also the coolest of us all. When I got off the plane, I thought, what have I done? It was just cold and wet. One of the guys had asked me, he said, what are you looking for? And I said, to be honest with you, I said, I'm just looking for the black people. I said, I, I don't see anybody. It was cold and wet and no black people around. I just thought, okay. It's one thing to walk in a building and be the, basically the only black, but then it's another thing to be in the country and it's not that it mattered, it was just the fact that you just didn't see any. I'd never been in that situation where you just didn't see any. The odd time you'd hear kids, you know, might say something because they just weren't used to seeing blacks in the street. But anyway, there was this dog that just kind of stopped and, and started barking at us. And, and Smitty just kind of made the remark that even the dog's not used to seeing black people here, you know? The theory behind the three-point line essentially is to try and negative the effect of tall men like Terry Strickland. Terry had style. Terry had hands as big as shovels. He could palm a ball. He could pick it up like a little grape. He could do anything he wanted with it, you know. I've seen himself and Ray Smith. They were just standing at a basket and they were just in a standing position. They had a ball in each hand and they were just jumping and dunking it just for fun, the two of them. And we were like, well, we can't even do it off a run. In that same season that saw Terry Strickland join Neptune, their local rivals, Blue Demons, matched it with a signing that proved to be one of the best in this era. Jasper McElroy was from my hometown, Chicago, and was a basketball legend there. Blue Demons would become his home for pretty much the next seven seasons. I'm a 21, 22-year-old kid that's taking a chance, you know, going half around the world that I don't know anybody, don't know what to expect, but I wanted to chase my dream of playing professional basketball, whether it was in the NBA or, or in Europe, you know, somewhere where I'm getting paid to play the sport I love. All I knew about Ireland is what I've seen on, on television, you know, movies like The Quiet Man, um, the accent, but what I did know is they spoke English and that was important to me. I didn't want to go to a country where, you know, I would have a language problem. And it was probably one of the best decisions of my life. But Cork wasn't the only city to react to Party's move on the American players. My old club, Cholester, was one of five strong teams in the capital, and we would showcase one of the very best characters ever to play the game in Ireland, Kelvin Troy. They spoke too fast, man. You know, they used to say to me, oh, you speak fast. I said, man, you speak faster than me. You speak like Puerto Ricans. 
Yep, 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 yep. And I, and I was just trying to, I was trying to catch on. And then going to Cork or the North or to the West, oh man, forget it. And another thing that bothered us was this. It really bothered me, the guys doing like this. You see a guy be doing like this. And we were saying, what are you doing like that for, man? And my wife said, that's like saying hello, how you doing? And I didn't know that, man. It would trip me out, though, man. People were doing that kind of stuff, man. Oh, my buddy and I were ready to knock somebody in the head, man. We do because that's like saying, that's like really kind of off in you, like. Interesting move, and that's Calvin Troy. He waited for Strickland. The NBA is the hardest league in world sport to get into. One in a million make it. Brian O'Driscoll makes it. Paul O'Connell doesn't make it. These were the second, third, fourth in a million guys. That was how talented quite a number of these guys were. In 1984-85, eight of the 20 Americans in the first division in Ireland had been drafted in the NBA. That meant they were in the top 200 college players in all of America. And Johnson has it, and he throws up a prayer. And he does. Magic Johnson throws up a prayer to tie it up and look at him. In Ireland, basketball is predominantly a middle class game, but Cork had to be different. There, it was very much working class and north side. Every street in that part of the city had a basket or a small bicycle wheel hung up on a telephone pole, and in the 80s, this small area would become a hotbed of champions. At the time, the place was ravaged with unemployment, but you had those kids, or those who were unemployed, one of the things they could turn to was basketball. But unlike the Irish players who were all amateur, we Americans were being taken in as professionals, so money was needed to pay our wages. Enter Mayo man Jackie Solon, who had just introduced the fast food chain Burgerland to Cork. Neption were the dominant team of that era. That was basically because they had the best sponsor, Jackie. He was a bit like a Bravimich, you know. He was both the money man and he was the showman. That was one of the stipulations that the team would be called Burgerland. We called it Burgerland International. I had to get the value for my sponsorship because I was putting in quite a bit of money into it. I was uh, an ardent follower of Michael Jordan and that kind of basketball player who was exciting. If you've seen any of the NBA games, which I did years ago, it's just incredible, Razzmatazz and Duncan, and it's a real crowd pleaser. And I think when we started, we brought that to Cork. He wanted showmanship, he wanted dunks, he wanted anything that would bring a crowd into an arena, right? He wanted it, and he also wanted the best team in the country. And we got lucky, we got very lucky with the Americans we had. He wanted black guys who could jump out of the building and were walking advertising boards for his restaurant. I believe Jackie would say Terry Strickland and Ray Smith were his best signings, and they would establish themselves as probably the best duel the league would ever know. In the final second or so, well, it'll be a grandstand finish. The clock ticks on to eight seconds. Strickland upsets the rhythm. Can Strickland win the cup? He can! In the 1980s, Demons Neptune was as good a rivalry as Irish domestic sport can get. 
uh, you had one period where they played each other 17 times in national competition and only once was there more than nine points between the teams. So everything is ready. Let's hope it lives up to its billing. These matches are usually thrillers. The Neptune and Demons, you didn't even know with 20 seconds who was going to win. It was going to go to the wire. It was going to go down to the last shot, the last basket, probably taken by either Terry Strickland or Jasper McElroy. The rivalry between the two was absolutely phenomenal. Cork Kerry, uh, Munster Leinster, that type of thing. But this was more intense. Here's a three point attempt. Neptune playing Blue Demons. I mean, if you didn't get there a couple hours early, you didn't get in. I remember playing one game up at the, the parochial hall that was actually kids had climbed up the walls and were hanging off the rafters looking at the game. Weider by Kennedy. The crowd was just so intense, and all people talked about was in that old Irish way that we're going to beat the out of Neptune. There is no way at this stage that demons are going to be wrong. I can see the intensity in these people. I'm not talking about the players, just the fans. You know, I can see the intensity in these fans' eyes of, you have to beat this team. So that start kind of letting me know that this, this rivalry can be something a little special. So now they can use up their 30 seconds clock and tie Stevens into fouls if they so wish, or Bergeland rather into fouls, like there. Tom Wilkinson commits his fifth foul and so he must leave the match and Mono showing how much he likes Jasper McElroy. I don't remember any other mark where we would have a game plan and it would be um, keep McElroy to 40 points. Like that's a hell of a lot of scoring, like you know. We keep the 40 and we win the game. Jerry Wheeler for Jasper McElroy, the confident and assured American. His second score. He was a machine. I, I don't think I've seen anybody score as much as him, you know. You just couldn't keep your eye off him for a second. He could use every part of his body to get open to shoot a ball. Well, releasing it so quickly to McElroy. In my view, Jasper McElroy is the best player that ever came to Ireland to play in the Irish League. He was certainly the best scorer. Jasper McElroy was one of the top scorers in American college basketball. He, he scored more in college than Michael Jordan did. I mean, to get 20 points a game in college, you have to be a top player. Nope. The other thing about Jasper he was he was an absolute competitor. He just seemed to love the big games, the, the occasion. He was a crowd favourite. Jasper in particular just seemed to have that bit of an aura and coolness about him that just made him, you know, an icon in Cork. I started this love affair with um, with Ireland and the Blue Demons organization. It was like, um, from day one, we just hit it off. Now if you're thinking, who was the one real standout personality of this era, the one American who was truly unforgettable for all the right and wrong reasons, some might say, then you're just gonna have to hang on just a little bit longer and I'll tell you all about him and you won't be disappointed. The rivalry down in Cork between Neptune and Demons was fierce. But up in Dublin, basketball was hopping as well, especially when along came a unique player from Lakewood, New Jersey. Kelvin Troy's flamboyant, passionate, aggressive style and personality made him easily the most popular player ever to play in Dublin and in equal measures a most difficult opponent for Cork's two premier teams. Guy Brian O'Hanlon comes up with this Irish accent. He says, "Oh, my name is Brian O'Hanlon, and he says I'm from St. Vincent's uh, Basketball Club in Ireland." He said, "I think you're the best player out there." I said, "Oh, you know that I am the best player out there." I said, "You never said anything wrong about that. I'm the best out there." And he sent me a book as well. He sent me a book of Irish basketball. They had the McHales on the cover, and flipping Anthony and them guys he had beards that were like this flipping hillbillies. I said, "Oh man," I said, "I'm going to a real okey doke place, man." He was a, as tough a basketball player as I've ever played against in my life. When he walked on the court and picked up a ball, it was like a switch went off in his head and he was oblivious to anything around him. He didn't care. 
He was going to try to score. He was going to try to D you up. He was going to talk junk to you. And once the game was over, he was there slapping five with you, talking about what's up, Strick, or whoever he was playing against. And he'd laugh and carry on with you in the pub. And he's talking to you like everything's cool. Here's one of the Americans. This man has been in Irish basketball for three seasons. For two years, he's played with Colester. Good defense against Kelvin Troy by Ray Smith, but he's lost it to Martin Grinnell, to Troy. And Kelvin Troy finishes what he started, and it brought a smile to the face of Ray Smith. I couldn't hold it in, you know? Somebody grabbed me, I'm gonna give him one, bam! Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde, that's where my coach always said you had to be. I was programmed that way. Like if something happened on court, for instance, you know, God wants to fight me. My brother said, why not wait after the game? Why not wait until I did? I said, man, forget that. I said, I ain't angry enough after the game to get someone. I said, I have to do it then. I said, because once the game is over, it's over. I said, I'm not going to wait until after the game and then. I mean, what, what kind of person is that? That's like, that's like premeditated murder. Nesmith, very cultured performer, but that's a good piece of rebounding by a very determined Kelvin Troy. What a good burst this is. Kevin was another guy that brought people into gyms. Mother of God, you just come to see him. He had the skinniest legs in the world and he had the biggest chest you could ever see. He was huge out here, big, huge man. And he'd come into the gym and he'd have a big mean face on him and he'd want to intimidate people and he'd want to walk up and grunt and growl and snarl at you and do all that stuff, you know? And you're looking at him like, we're well, going for a rebound here with him, he's going to mangle you, you know? Best defender probably ever to come into the country. Without a shadow of a doubt, had to be Kelvin Troy. Kelvin Troy to give his side the lead. So much now resting on the shoulders of Kelvin Troy. At the time, it was outright war. But I have respect for that guy because he never backed down and he was a damn great basketball player. Kelvin, of all the Americans to come here, had the highest profile in college. Anybody who watched American college basketball in the late 70s, early 80s, to this day can remember Kelvin Troy from Rutgers. They were one of the top teams in the States, and he was one of their top players. He was ranked one of the top five defensive players in America. Sports Illustrated did a spread, and any player who played against him respected that man and will remember that man because of the intensity he played with. Oh, oh, man, does that look nice? He warmed up with greater intensity than other fellas played the game. One, two, three, one, two. Am I looking like a pro? Oh, yes, ooh! What's the name? I didn't know anything about Ireland, you know? When I was coming, I really believed in leprechauns, man, I'm telling you. That leprechaun jumping around there like that, man, flip it, huh. No, man, people don't know much about Ireland and America, man. Especially black people, no way. No, nope. but the thing that I'm here, I think it's wonderful. It's meant for me. You gotta always remember that it's meant for me. That's the one thing I'm great, grateful for that I'm here and my kids are Irish because everybody likes the Irish. They love the Irish, man. Everyone. It's the only place I'm blessed. I tell people that all the time. The only place I'm blessed. <laughs> Irish people have always been good to me, always, because it's my home. But not all the Americans that came into Ireland in the 1980s were black and six foot eight. Dave Hopler is considered one of the best shooting coaches in the world and has worked extensively in the NBA with various teams and players like Kobe Bryant. In the 1981 season, the Baltimore A shooter arrived in Belfast and played three seasons with St. Gauls. The 1980s was a tough time in Northern Ireland, with Belfast seeing the worst of the troubles. But basketball seemed to rise above the conflicts, and much like in the rest of the country, it thrived during this period. The first major adjustment I had was, you know, seeing the RUC and uh, the soldiers pointing guns at people and stuff. That was a little, like, nerve-wracking. But after being there for a while, like you said, you, you get familiar with it funny experience my first day in, in Belfast. We were having dinner over at Mickey and Marie Gribbins where I was eventually staying with the family and uh, 
coach Dirk and I were going to go for a walk over at Ormo Park, and we were running across the street, and Dan stepped on the curb, and he had a bad knee to begin with, and his knee gave out. And I thought, like, you know, one of the soldiers picked him off or something. Basketball seemed to get on with what it was doing right through the 80s, uh, even though there was turmoil all around. Places like Anderson's Town were basically closed down. There was one road in and one road out. Um, going to training and back, you'd have been stopped by the army two or three times before you got home. Initially, he, his heart was in his, his pocket, you know. I would say he was quite intimidated by it initially. But I think he, he knew there was a lot of people around him that were giving him support. And, uh, you know, he was never in any danger, let's put it that way. Belfast, luckily having other Americans, and we were pretty tight, you know, we would get together, you know, for a few pints and stuff. They welcomed all of us, all the Americans in with open arms, and uh, I think, uh, I don't know, because of maybe the troubles, they wanted you to feel more comfortable and at ease being there, but uh, I, I have nothing but the utmost uh, respect for my teammates and all the people in St. Gauls. That was the great thing about basketball, it brought you know, the Catholics and Protestants together in Belfast. I was on the same team as Dave. He was a tremendous shooter. Still is, he was across for a clinic there about two years ago and is shooting the lights out as, as always. <laughs> Hasn't aged like the rest of us. But first of all, we thought he was too small, so we were a bit concerned uh, because uh, most of the other teams that were in the National League were recruiting six foot six, six foot seven. And here Dave was at about six foot one, I think. Um, but he made up for it in his shooting prowess. Dave has gone on to become a top shot doctor in the NBA and is currently with the New York Knicks, coaching the likes of Olympian Carmelo Anthony. That's it. Stay low. Low and you'll be on balance. Low and you'll be on balance. Lift it, hands, hands ready, hands ready. See, as Americans, when we lost, we took it personally, and like after the game, I'd want to go home, I'd want to go to Mickey Marie's and go up in my room and sulk, play the game over my head. And I learned in Ireland, man, win or lose, we booze, man, and you know, you forgot about the game, and I mean, that was a great thing, like, you know, you got to know your opponent. I mean, when we would go down, we would play in Dublin. Okay, after the game, we'd go out and have a few pints. I mean, it, you left it on the, on the court. It was a, a great time of my life. I have nothing but fond memories. It's got to be an all-time thing. Oh, oh. It's got to be all the time. Oh. Now the 80s basketball buzz spread to all corners of the country. And nowhere did it have such an impact as it did in the town of Balaná, County Mayo. The Balaná team, playing out of the community hall in Kalala, were known for their passion and commitment and were led by a tight group of friends and most notably the three McHale brothers, Sean, Anthony, and the youngest, Lean. It was a real rites of passage in Mayo life as a teenager back in that time to go to see Balaná and to see how they'll get on against the big city boys. Balaná have won on the national stage and other than themselves and Killarney, they were the only teams to do that. Um, everything else was, was, was the preserve of the Cork and Dublin clubs. And I think it's no coincidence that exceptional players and men were the mainstays of those teams that broke the city powers. Paddy O'Connor from Killarney, and 10 years later, Liam McHale, just uh, a standout talent. Inside for Liam McHale. And Liam was probably the outstanding Irish player of his generation, probably the best Irish player to ever play in the league. He was the one that consistently outscored Americans. Kelvin Troy says that if he had played Division I college basketball, he'd have made the NBA. Liam was the, the, exactly what they said. He was like, man, he would have a great basketball game, and he loved playing against me because he, he wanted to show me how good he was, but he was excellent. And then, of course, he would march. Right when the other mask came on the floor, that place went wild. Trying to release it to the other mask. The winner goes. Opening two minutes of the match, Dior Marsh will provide... Dior Marsh, the easygoing, likable, athletic young man from Mississippi, arrived west, and he took to Balaná and their Kalala base instantly. 
I haven't seen him training this hard in years. <laughs> he's, he's moving more there than a... I've gone lazy, no. Huh? Gone lazy. Lazy? You would never get him doing weights now or anything like that. Just all natural athletic ability. That's... The night before a game I trained hard, though. The night before the game. <laughs> He arrived here on a, on a Friday, and I called up to the apartment he was staying in. He was, he, he was gone. And I went uptown and I found him in, in Leonard's Lounge Bar playing rummy with about five or six other fellas. And he, like, that just goes to show that it was like he wasn't going to sit in the house and be homesick. He was going to get out there and meet people and enjoy himself. And he always had that attitude. And, you know, he's a very, very popular man in this town ever since that day. From that last basket, he certainly does that. It's A lot of teams you hate to come to because it's, it's a small gym. We used to get four, five, six hundred people in it. You'd be like, Jesus Christ, where did all they come from? I don't know if they had a few drinks on them before they got to the game, but they used to be rowdy. <laughs> they would always get there early. They get their spot, the same spot every time. And they'd be beating the drums, and they'd beat the drums the whole game. The floor, the blue line there would be, there'd be feet all around it. And his uh, opponent was, was tripped when he was dri dribbling the ball up the court, up the sidelines, and it was just bedlam in here. When you're taking the ball on in the sidelines, they'd be pulling at the hairs in the back of your legs, you know, <laughs> just trying to distract you, you know. I was passionate, it was brilliant. It would put the hairs up in the back of your neck. They used to always be chanting D or uh, D or even to this day I do walk down the street sometimes you get some shout D or uh. I'd heard about him when the season started and they talked about how well he could jump. But of course when I first saw him, I thought, God, he's real skinny. But I tell you, as far as athleticism goes. That boy, he had some serious hops. I mean, he could jump out of the gym. The last thing you wanted to do was be caught on camera with him jumping over you, dunking on you. buddies, really, that always went out together. And I think that was the, really the core that really stood to us on the basketball court, being buddies outside the court. Married now with three children, the man from Mississippi has made Bana his home. Oh, yeah, I, I guess once you're in, into a place, living in a place for three or four years, maybe five or six years, it's kind of like home away from home. Okay. States will always be my main home because my mom and dad and sister and brothers are there. But about now, it's just like home away from home. It's just as good as home. <laughs> the huge success and popularity of basketball in Cork was highlighted on January 1st, 1985, when the Neptune Stadium, Ireland's most state-of-the-art indoor sports facility, opened its doors. At the time, you had all the GA stadiums were pretty much, even then, pretty dilapidated. You had Crow Park, Lansdowne Road. And the most amazing thing about this was it was built by a small club with 46 adult members on the north side of Cork. They were the only club at the time in Europe to have their own basketball arena. Everybody else had the local city or county council to take care of it. I can still remember the first time I went to Ireland. We had a lot of our practices outside. Neptune at the time didn't have the stadium. But when you walked into the parochial hall or 
some of the, the gyms, you couldn't believe it, like the heat might not be going. And there were some places that were taken because of bingo. Uh, I can remember playing and practicing in one gym that had carpet. And I thought, God, you'd never get this back home. I think it played a big part in the community because nobody else in the country really had the place that they could say, this is ours. We loved playing in that place and we loved calling it home. And you have to remember, there was another layer to the Demons-Neptune rivalry, and that was the competition that existed between the Americans themselves on each opposing team. If we had a game on Saturday, I might have seen Terry Wednesday night. We might even went out and had a few pints on Wednesday. But for the next 48 hours, if I seen Terry in town, he barely got a hello. When we stepped on the court, I didn't like Terry Strickland. Didn't like him at all. Terrific by Smith. McElroy is trying to make sure, and the foul is committed by Terry Strickland. McElroy at the line, but remember, seconds left in the game. He was that tough competitor, and you knew when you played against him that, you know, you were in for a long night. He could score 30 and have a bad night, but you always enjoyed playing against him. Can Bergelan come back? We would hang out together off the court, but on the court, we had a job to do, and he was as good as they come. For those few years, like Jasper McElroy was a god on the north side of Cork. Ray Smith, Terry Strickland, they were gods. They couldn't believe, you know, the, how they were treated here. The kids in particular, I mean, you'd see them down Patrick Street, had to be kids following them and everything, you know, it was just incredible. It was just the way they carried themselves, even walking into the gym. And you go into the club afterwards and the Irish lads would be there with their parka jackets or their bomber jackets or their denim jackets. Next thing, Strickland and McElroy come in with their design leather jackets. The girls are there, looks up, sees a six foot five guy who's probably scored 40 points in the game they were at, and his designer jacket, and you're there with your park or a denim jacket. She's not going home with you. But the celebrities are the Kobe Bryant and the LeBron James in America and the Michael Jordans in that era. We were we were that over there. I'm not gonna kid you. I mean, it was nice when I could go downtown and and people would recognize you or shake your hand and uh I maybe want to go in a pub and have a beer with him or something. But of course, another thing too is if you weren't winning, you probably weren't going to be around to walk down the street because if you weren't playing well, they did not mind sending you home. I used to put my guys on bonuses, win bonuses. You win it, you'll get it, and it worked. Others demanded, we sent them packing. Uh, I always remember sending a player home, and I think he joined some team in the NBA. Uh, and he was a fabulous player, but he was just wasn't what I was looking for. I think a lot of teams jump too quickly to move players. Like, if you lost two or three games in a row, then they would look at the American first, and they wouldn't hesitate to try to ship one out and bring another one in, and if that one didn't work out, then ship him out and bring another one in. I just think a lot of teams didn't have the patience to give the Americans time to fit in. And some adjusted quicker than others. I think I adjusted fairly well, and. Smitty adjusted, Jasper adjusted well, but some guys, it takes that adjustment time. And of course, if you're losing while you're adjusting, you know, you're probably on the plane home. As Cork's two Northside teams battled it out, up the road in Dublin, a new dynamic American, Mario Ellie, arrived in Colester. I can remember it like it was yesterday because I was his coach while he was here. He came to partner Kelvin Troy. What a partnership that turned out to be. It also illustrates the great understanding the players have. I kind of knew I wanted to go overseas. It was a great opportunity for me to work on my game, see the world, make a little bit of money. I just got thrown right in the fire. I think I flew in the night before and had to play the next day. Once I played my first couple games, I said, I think I'm going to be all right over here. 
At least I had an American on my team, but the American I had was Calvin. He had a family, and he was also terrific. I mean, he was a great teammate. He really took care of me and uh, brought me under his wing. It's good to bond with your teammate, you know, a guy that relates to you, speaking English, talking about back home. I made my adjustment over there real easy. We were really close. He used to say to me, Troy, man, you, you need to go play somewhere else. You're too good to play here. I said, man, I don't want to play anywhere else. I love it here. And I'm telling you, man, you stupid, man. I'm going to travel the world. But that's what he wanted to do. That wasn't what I wanted to do. Calvin Troy on the drive again. Outside of him, he's got Gary Connolly. Look at the tricks. Beautifully working his way inside, combining with the other American, Mario Eli. He was one of the better players coming out the States, you know, and I'm wondering why he didn't come back and play. He was an excellent defender, a supreme athlete, and I thought he could have played maybe in a bigger stage, whether it was overseas or maybe give the NBA a chance. I don't know why he didn't think about that. But uh, some guys are just comfortable. He was comfortable in Ireland. He really adapted to the life. He found a woman he really loved, and he was sort of comfortable and content over there. The dynamic with Kelvin and Mario was a fascinating one. And they played some of the best basketball that's ever been seen in this country together. And there were times where they clicked together and it was just beautiful to watch. Um, it's this great team sport, but there is also an element of dealing with the individual and the ego. And there is the sort of, who's the man? And at that time, there was always that unresolved thing in Kelester, who was the man? There's good backing up by the two Americans, reading one another's intentions well. Eli nips inside, and that's an important score. It was good until the last game of the season. How good players always have egos, and we sort of clashed a little bit during that final game, and that really disappointed me. So I sort of left there a little bitter, you know. It was going great the whole year, and uh, just uh, I remember something happened in the game. He had said something to me, and we sort of exchanged, but it wasn't pleasant. He went to pass me the ball. So I said, Emmy, pass me the ball. Emmy, pass me the ball. He went pass me the ball, right? I was wide open. So I walk up to him. I said, Emmy, why you didn't pass me the ball, man? Oh, you got somebody behind you, man. You got somebody behind So I said, I pushed him. I said, where the F you want him? Where the, where the F you want him? And he walked away, walked off the court in the middle of the game. So after the game, I was looking at him. He's walking off, and I said, I'm going to go walk right behind him. So he was in the locker room, and I went right behind him, sitting by the time. I said, hey, Emmy. I said, how you doing, man? F you, man. I said, oh, Emmy, man. I said, I'm your partner, man. He didn't speak to me. He hasn't spoke to me since. After a winning season with us at Colester, Mario returned home, and I'm glad to say enjoyed many successful seasons playing in the NBA. He's won three world championship rings, and he is now the assistant coach with the Brooklyn Nets. You know, I played every game my hardest. You know, I had a good time over there. Thought I played very well. I thought I left a mark over there. The journey I took, you know, to make it to the NBA, you know, I had an interesting journey, so. And the good thing about that journey, it started in Ireland. This is the part of the story that I'm not looking forward to telling because the year after Mario left for the NBA in the spring of 87, everything changed in Irish basketball. In 1986, when the sport was approaching its height, a commission was established by Basketball Ireland to find out about what should be done with the future of the sport. Its main conclusion was that it should go from two Americans per Division I team to only one American. 80% of the clubs decided to go from two Americans to one American, and they asked the National Executive Committee of the Association to endorse and support that, which they did. And it came into play in the 1988-1989 season, and uh, there was a very negative reaction in Cork to it. They felt that uh, they were being unjustly treated and almost being punished for being successful. I remember some people thinking, well, if there's two Americans, it's hard for the Irish players to develop. Totally nonsense. Just, it was totally the opposite. You get better by playing against better competition, even in practice. Powerful basket, it counts. 
They should have been looking at it in a different way that, great, let's bring in as many as we can. And then people will say to you, well, what about the local guys? Well, you know what? The local guys could do what I was trying to do and get better. So they could play with these guys. And as a result, that would automatically bring the standard of the kids to the right level. Well, I suppose if you're looking at it, if there's 10 on the court and four of them are Americans, you know, there's only six Irish players really getting a chance. I can see the argument for reducing to, to, to one American, but um, you know, I think it may be backfired a wee bit, to be honest with you. The argument was on two fronts. There was the player development argument. The second argument was the economic financial one, which was that it was just costing too much to pay a second American. That was the argument, particularly from clubs, particularly outside of Cork and the smaller clubs. And ultimately they won the day. A number of clubs said, no, we can't afford it. I, the reason they couldn't afford it is they weren't doing enough work to get sponsors. Sponsors were always out there in the early days. If you look back in history and it's there in black and white what happened, crowds just went away and that was the end of basketball. That was crazy. It was suicide really, to be honest. For the game itself, we lost it. We lost our, our age compared to other sports, you know. We had a little diamond, right? And we didn't know what to do with it. You know, I, I think from, from the ground up, from the players all the way to the association, I don't think everybody knew what we had, like, you know. It wasn't fun anymore, you know, it wasn't no razzmatazz anymore. It, it, it was just gone, you know? I see it now as being a tragedy, personally, because um, the people that came over came with good intent, all the players that we brought over, I think, and loved the experience of playing in Ireland, and as obvious, some of them are still living there many, many years later. And um, the game itself should have progressed, but in fact, it's gone backward. You look back at it now with very fond memories, but at the same time there's a, a, a tinge of disappointment in looking back because you'd love to see the league and basketball being as popular as it was then. I don't know how it's going to be fixed, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a very difficult task to get players to want to play as much as we want. There's so many distractions out there now, there's so many different high-profile games out there now. I'll speak to some of the guys, I said, God, I think I'm glad that I got to play when basketball was at its best in Ireland, you know. I would love to see it picked up. I, mean, I care a lot about the, the basketball in, in Ireland. Uh, but, you know, I would always say, yeah, but it ain't like what it used to be, you know. The game, you know, it's still called basketball, but if you weren't there in the 80s, you, then you don't know basketball. <laughs> Whether basketball in Ireland will ever return to the golden years of the 80s or not, one thing is certain, it will live on in my mind as a very special time where us Americans, along with the Irish lads, lit up the parish halls and gyms all over this country and made sporting history. Well, the Troy, take it aside, the lead.